doing fine. I'm doing strange. But uh, if you're not doing strange, I think you're really not hooked into reality of the day. That's that's my my new my new little catch line. Uh, I'm I'm very bothered about what's going on. I'm not sleeping well. I'm very worried about what's coming later this year. Um, I just don't want to be disconnected in a foreign land, but I don't want to see my country go go through a shit storm. And I think we're possibly going to be approaching it <clears throat> and work our way through what I call a systemic layman event. Now, we went through layman in September and October of 2008. Well, Mitch, I, I think we're working now toward a bigger crisis with many more triggers, and when they go off, it's going to be a lot more than just mortgage bonds that have a problem. It's going to be mortgage bonds, bonds that include car loans, student loans, and the U.S. government debt, along with several other sovereign debt, you know, the, the sovereign debt from several other countries. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to be seeing a lot of corporate failures you know take a look at uh, what the euro central bank european central bank has done in the last just say six months and what the united states has copied uh in policy in and their conversation at least for the last two or three months and that is to support the corporate bond market in much the way they supported the u.s treasury bond and the mortgage bond market now, they've destroyed the mortgage bond market and destroyed the U.S. Treasury bond market. Its integrity is completely gone, both of them. And you can see that by the nature of the buyers and sellers of the U.S. Treasury bonds. There are very few buyers left. And the main buyers are the U.S. Department of Treasury and the U.S. Federal Reserve. I think they're buying 80 to 90 percent of the bonds. So... The corporate bond, I think, is going to be a major problem when this systemic layman moment comes. And people ask me, why do you call it a systemic layman moment? Well, it's layman in its severity, but it's systemic this time because it's going to go far beyond mortgage bonds. And something happened following layman. This is not well known, Mitch, to a lot of people, but in 2009 and 10. A lot of the big banks started lashing themselves together. They started to uh, tie themselves together with their risk portfolios, their risk management techniques and vehicles. So that, for instance, it wasn't just J.P. Morgan and Bank of America that had the major load of derivatives. They started distributing them across the other major banks in Wall Street, so they're all pretty much the same. For instance, between, uh, between July of 2010 and December of 2010, Morgan Stanley alone picked up $8.5 trillion worth of interest rate swap derivatives, just Morgan Stanley. Yes, yes. Wow. And and now you're seeing what you've seen in the last six years is, is that spread across all the major banks now, including the European banks in Western Europe. So I call it systemic layman moment coming because when any any one or two big banks enters a failure coming up, it's going to take down entire national banking systems because they're tied together with this kind of insurance vehicle cable portfolio technique with the derivatives. They're sharing the risk, and therefore they cannot let, for instance, Deutsche Bank go down. Deutsche Bank should have failed several months ago. Yes, I, I so. thought they put in for another uh, $8.5 billion worth of capital they're trying to raise. Yeah, eight eight and a half billion euros, which is about the same eight and a half billion dollars, and it, they're still not solvent. There was a there was an analysis done by a very sharp fellow uh, about two 
pardon me, about two years ago, year and a half ago, and he used some of the same techniques that he used to to come up with a, a valuation of the Lehman Brothers portfolio. And he had a before and after scenario. Before he had his estimates, after the Lehman failure, he had actual numbers. And he concluded, based on the, the, the reality of the data, because it, it unfolded as a disaster and a, a bank failure, financial firm failure, uh, he had a ratio of two and a half to one. Well, he did the same analysis with Deutsche Bank and came up with an estimate that the portfolio, the whole book, the, the, the books for Deutsche Bank were worth minus $400 billion. <laughs> so apply the two and a half to one and you get minus 1,000 billion, which is True. minus $1 trillion for the Deutsche Bank value. Now, I ask you, do you think eight and a half billion euros will address their problem or act pretty much like a patch uh, and a small? Yeah, I don't even think that's going to be a Band-Aid patch or size patch. Uh, uh, who's going to, well, how is this going to unwind? Well, that's what I call the systemic layman moment. When, when the crash happens, you're going to get contagion. So it really won't unwind as much as collapse. You're not going to get like a, a big movement to sell off the Deutsche Bank debt, to sell off the Bank of America debt, to sell off the Royal Bank of Scotland debt. It's going to be a crash where there may not be much of any buyers looking for, say, 30 cents on the dollar on asset pickups. They might just stay away and say, hey, wait, we, we've got to get out of the way because it's RBS, three other London banks, and we don't know how many more. So we're not going to make a bid on a collapsing bank because we suspect that there are going to be a lot of banks collapsing. That's what I expect to happen. There's not going to be any kind of remedy in a, a micro sense, like how are they going to remedy RBS in London? They're not. They're not. Yeah. What they're going to do is you're going to have a macro solution with, say, uh, uh, the banks recapitalizing using gold bullion. The gold standard is going to come back. The solution to what, we, what ails us is the gold standard, both in trade payment and in bank reserves. And I mentioned those two specifically because those are the two sides of the practical element to the dollar's global reserve currency status. Because of that global reserve, reserve currency status, the dollar is used for, say, trade payments, like oil shipments or container vessels. They're paid in dollars. Trade in treasury bills, the short-term bills. And banking systems go to the other end of the, of the maturity for the bond curve. They look for treasury bonds and the 10-year notes to put in their banking system, like, for instance, in France or Korea. They're not using gold in France and Korea. They're using treasury bonds in France and Korea. So I think what it adds up to, Mitch, is we're going to see the dollar lose its global currency reserve status. And it, it could come in steps, but it could also come very suddenly. It'll come on the trade side and the bank reserves, bank asset side. So. I tell you, absolutely. Um, you know, when this, um, you know, I, I've heard you talk before about the shice dollar, and it's really just the trash dollar that the American people are going to have to deal with um, internally, and then there's going to be uh, another SDR standard or type of dollar for international trade. Um, do you think the American people have a clue what's coming? As far as the, the, with the way trade is here in the United States, we get so much of our goods from outside the country that they don't realize we pay, we say, what, 6% right off the top, and then all of the other benefits from that uh, being the world 
reserve currency. The American people don't have a clue what's going to happen in their stores to foreign products. No, I, I, I don't think they do. And, and the percentages I, I usually throw out there are that 90 percent of the American public really doesn't have any idea what the dollar is. 90 percent of the public doesn't really know what inflation is. 90 percent of the public really doesn't know what capital formation is. 90% of the public really doesn't know what fascism is. 90% of the public doesn't know what to expect when they get suddenly surprised by an announcement that the United States is going to have to issue its own domestic only dollar. Now, 90% of the American public also don't know about something regarding the dollar. They don't even knew, know that the dollar is used outside the United States. I've talked to a lot of Americans. I mean, I talk to tourists, oh, I, I, I would say a couple every week. I try to talk to fewer lately because they're so annoying. But I, I ask basic questions like, golly, what do you, what do you think's going on with the, the central bank now? They're, they're buying the U.S. government debt. They, didn't, they weren't aware that they were buying the U.S. government debt that the Fed was buying U.S. government deficit monetized. They weren't aware. And I asked, well, do you, by the way, do, do you know what it means when I say the dollar as a, as a global reserve currency? No, they don't have any idea. I, I've only met one or two that have in 10 years. And, you know, I, I'm not talking about Joe Q. Public here. I, I'm talking about tourists who at least have the ability to get a, to get a, a passport and travel, put some money together. Yeah. But I also asked them, are you aware that the dollar is used outside the United States? And they say, well, I know they take it here at this hotel. Oh, and, I, and I said, are you aware, though, that it's used in trade, like to pay for a, a shipment between China and Bolivia? No, I didn't know that. I, I mean, the dollar is the strongest currency in the world. I'm not surprised. I mean, OK, so you don't get a lot of awareness. So. What I'd like to do, Mitch, is describe the incredible problem that's coming with the introduction of the Scheiss dollar. Please can I, can I, Please okay, do. okay. Here's how it's likely to be forced into a launch and introduction. Foreign countries own a tremendous amount of reserves in their banking systems, like Korea. They own billions of treasury bonds. So when they see that the central bank in the United States is printing money to cover the U.S. government debt, and they're redeeming Wall Street big bank bonds, and, and redeeming them and their mortgage bonds, you, you see a, a long list of foreign nations very, very angry because we're acting like Zimbabwe and African nations, and a few in history, recent history, South American nations, printing money to cover our debt because there is an inadequate number of buyers and investors. It's called monetizing your debt. If an African nation does that, their total economy is destroyed in less than one year. We've been doing it for six years now, and putting at risk the entire global economy. So these nations are saying, we're trying to work now toward a non-dollar alternative. We'd like to have some Chinese RMB bonds in our banking system. We'd like to have some more gold bullion in our banking system. They got a, a real retort backfire from putting in euro bonds in their banking system because the European Union is now a total mess. Okay, that's just the banking side for the anger against what's going on with the dollar. On the other side, you have trade payments. You have country after country paying in treasury bills for a load on a ship, whether it's oil, container vessels, containers, uh, or, or say, just a big barge of cement or coal or wheat. Okay, they're paying in dollars. And they're objecting because they say, well, if our country uses currency X and we sell to country Y, 
we'd rather use currencies from X or Y countries rather than buy into the treasury bonds and treasury bills because we'll have an extra cost in doing two transfers. We'd rather just go from X to Y. But we realize that the world is under this trade standard of using the dollar. So they get extra costs. They don't want the bother of temporarily holding dollars in their X and Y countries because we're printing dollars to cover our debt like the African nations do. All right. So they're all working toward the non-dollar platforms, which is, is what we've got now for, for question three. So we don't, we're, we're covering that now. Uh, these nations are saying we're, we're going to be working toward something different, not the dollar for our trade payment. And we don't want to collect all these treasury bonds in our banks because you're printing money to cover your debt, monetizing it like African nations are. We're going to be working toward the non-dollar platforms, which include the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. It includes the the cross-border interpayment system, otherwise known as the Chinese interbank payment system, the CIPS, which is a competitor to SWIFT. The SWIFT is basically a dollar transfer transaction system internationally. So we're getting very close to the gold trade note being used for trade payment. And the Russians and Chinese are putting together the components, I th believe, right now for that gold trade note. Apart from all that, these nations, especially in the East Asia, are adding together, adding up, uh, adding to their reserve gold bullion. Okay. Now, here's the big risk for the new shy style. Those are the motives for the United States to be forced into the launch of a new dollar for domestic only purposes because trade payment will not be done in the dollar and the US importers just take say target staples and walmart yes. the suppliers in asia will not take dollars that's coming it's already started there, there are 20 different vendors including bobcat international that makes the little forklifts and little little diggers, little you know trench diggers, bobcat, they're like miniature caterpillars. Yes, sir. Okay, so <clears throat> they're, the U.S. is going to be forced to come up with a new dollar because otherwise we're going to have trouble with our trade import supply chain. Now here's the big risk when it finally happens: we have a 550 billion dollar annual trade deficit. If we were to make a new dollar and had the wisdom and capability to back it by gold, I mean like many thousand tons of gold, $550 billion equates to 13,000 tons of gold. That would be just the first year. We're talking about we're talking about creating an entire basket of assets to back the dollar. Whatever we back the dollar with, we will lose. The equivalent of $550 billion in the first year of those assets in our basket, which just to put into terms of, of money, gold is money, yes, 13,000 tons of gold, wow. which is a lot more than what Fort Knox held. Fort Knox was 8,500 tons before, well, no, 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 no. Fort Knox once had 8,500 tons until the 1990 decade when Clinton, Bush, and Rubin vacated it for their own personal profit. You can call it stealing if you wish. Okay, so if we have no backing to the new dollar, we're going to see massive devaluations like 30% every six months. If we have the good wisdom and fortune to back it with a, an asset like gold, as we once did back in the 70s, 
back in the 60s for Fort Knox. We will lose $550 billion or more of it every year, just for the first year, but I think we're not going to get reindustrialized fast enough. So Trump must do two things. Bring back industry to the United States while building up industry domestically. And the second thing is attract foreign capital, like, say, the trillion dollars he talked about from the Japanese government pension system to build the infrastructure in the United States. That would be a brilliant stroke because it would offset. If he were to get, say, $550 billion in, in commitments and, and, and massive fund flow to set things up, to rebuild bridges, highways, fiber optic system, port facilities, um, toll roads, high-speed bullet maglev trains like China has. We got four-lane highways. China has 16-channel high-speed trains. We're way behind China. If we were to attract $500 billion in one year for massive infrastructure construction, we could avoid the forfeit of those 13,000 tons of gold. We've got to get going, and I don't see any progress in three months because the, the fascist neocons are trying to interrupt all the cabinet appointments. I mean, we've already seen Flynn go from the National Advisor. Now there's a risk, I don't think it's going to happen, for Attorney General Sessions to go. They're trying to undermine every one of the main appointments from Trump. Trump can't get his job done. You're absolutely right. Back to the um, the non-U.S. dollar platforms and this this evolution of um, of currency and money that we're seeing. Um, could it could it be that going to a digital currency? Um, then they can really call it anything they want. They can call it the dollar. They can call it anything if they go all digital. Is, is that possible? Is that one route, maybe? Well, I don't think so, because if the East, by, by East I mean China, Russia, the BRICS nations, and 20 others, mm -hmm. like, like, Thai, like Thailand and Iran, they have to climb on board to the electronic money system. And right now they're suspicious of anything and everything that the Western nations do, led by Western Europe, Britain, and the United States, suspicious that it's just another fraudulent scheme. So the East, China, Russia, etc., they're not going to buy in to the International Monetary Fund and their SDR, Special Drawing Rights, basket. They're not going to buy into it. They're not going to use it. They're not going to accept it for payment in trade. They're not going to accept an SDR bond in trade at China. The Chinese companies are not going to take it. They don't trust it. There's a, well, yeah, but there's a, you know, there's an Austrian school of economics. They, they study and, and promote sound money principles. There's what I call the, the sound money corollary. If you have a failure of paper money and that paper money currency system, you cannot replace it with a paper-backed system as a solution. That's not my corollary. It's just what I call their, their, their principle. I call it the corollary. Okay, so there's a tricky movement planned, I believe, by the same banker cabal that, that runs the dollar that I think assassinated Kennedy in order to set up the crooked paper dollar. What I'm saying is the people who killed Kennedy are the same ones who brought Kissinger onto the scene, the Secretary of State, the same ones that made sure that, that Nixon, despite his absolutely horrible reputation after losing to Kennedy, could be revived from the dead, and set up the situation for reneging on the gold standard, all part of the Kennedy kill, renege on the gold standard from Bretton Woods and set up the petrodollar with Saudi Arabia and the Arab states in the Gulf. It's all part of what I believe the banker cabal plot to kill Kennedy and the aftermath, all that followed.
By the way, Richard Nixon went to a remote spot in Texas hosted by Lyndon Johnson, which contained CIA members and other shady members, along with Papa Bush. And I believe that meeting was to set up the Kennedy kill. I'm saying Nixon, I'm saying Nixon was part of the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Nothing surprises me, you know, what we know about the Bush and Clinton families today and all of the, uh, the drug dealing and the Iran-Contra scandal and all this other stuff. <coughs> and, you know, Pizza Gate's real. I mean, the, the, the mainstream media hasn't reported on any of this sweep going on across the United States right now this, of sweeping up these, these uh, pedophiles and getting them off the streets. Um, do you think? Uh, let me get uh, let me get back on topic here because you know, you know, with the dollar and foreign the foreign currency market, you know that all is kind of uh, tied. It's almost like it's all floating together, and one that one rises in valuation, the other ones devalue, and it all works back and forth. I mean, are is this just a constant way? To devalue the currency, to pay, to, to dilute now so you can pay for the future? Well, yeah, inflating the debt away is not a new concept. Uh, Reagan did it during the recession. Uh, Papa Bush did it. I mean, very few people remember Papa Bush dealt one year with a trillion dollar deficit. You know, he ran on a platform of balancing the budget. And Obama promised hope and change. What instead, what instead we got was a lot of golf, a lot of fundraisers, and gay sex parties at the White House. We're, we're inflating the debt away all the time. We're not, we're not just inflating the debt away now, we're monetizing it. We're not trying to pre create inflation. Okay, let me explain what inflate the debt away means as a term. It's an economic term. It means produce enough inflation. Like every year you have six, seven, eight, nine percent inflation. So that after a few years, the two million dollar debt that the company has seems like less because the, the dollar and, and the, the buying power has dropped. But as the buying power has dropped, the debt value has dropped too, okay? So we're not doing we're not doing inflating the debt away. We're monetizing the debt. We're printing money to cover the entire U.S. government debt. We're not only doing that, Mitch. We're we're actually involved in multi-trillion-dollar monthly coverage of bank derivatives to prevent the system from failing. Uh, I have a, a favorite story that I like to tell because it addresses the, the bank failure, but it also links the validity of some of my sources. I've got a fellow from Europe who I call The Voice. He's a, a major international gold trader and consultant. But I also have a U.S. government security agency source, military and security agency, homeland security, etc., I call him Cato, and I call the gold trader the voice. One time, I got on an elevator, and Cato, who lived near me at that time, that's how I met him, a uh, fascinating guy with lots of stories, tremendous personality. Um, he got on the elevator and said, Jimmy, I want you to check something. Bank of America almost failed last night. It had a big, big event. Bank of America needed $13 billion of, of dirty uh, dirty Papa Bush narco money th to save the day. And I said, wow. And he said to me, can you check this with the voice? Check it with your guy, will you? So I, I sent a message, and when I went back up, I stopped. I just reversed course, went back up the elevator when I hit the ground level, and I decided, okay, I'm going to make a message very quickly to the voice. He's on the other side of the world. Let's see how fast he can respond. But I was clever in my message, Mitch. I said a major U.S. bank on Wall Street suffered a multi-billion dollar overnight loss default 
and a elite American figure patched it. Do you have any details? And he wrote back three lines. Bank of America, 13 billion, Papa Bush. The exact details. So the people in the higher levels of finance, and that often includes the security agencies because they're watching the movement of money. Uh, and they're, you know, they're trying to stop terrorist funding, except when it's coming from the United States. Uh, they try to stop, you know, arms dealing movement from black market, like with Mexican cartel, unless it's coming from the United States. Um, but that's what they do. So we're, we're not inflating the debt away. Uh, we're monetizing the debt, which is a threat to the entire dollar structured system. We're running the risk of, of getting a critical mass of foreign countries that say, screw you, we're not going to use the dollar in either trade payment or the banking reserves. And that's why you're seeing the massive dumping in the last 12 months have been $420 billion worth of U.S. government debt dumped on the market. And I ask you, Mitch, if such an enormous amount was dumped on the market, how come the interest rate on the 10-year bond is still stable near 2%? quantitative easing <laughs> exactly exactly the, and, and and the back door is not the fed and their quantitative easing it's the department of treasury lapping up lots and lots of treasury bonds the biggest holder of treasury bonds right now is the department of treasury our own u.s government offices are the biggest holders of tre of u.s treasury bond of u.s government debt the second biggest is the fed but the Fed gets the notoriety and the bad attention when in the hidden chambers, it's the Department of Treasury that's lapping it up. So we're, we're at, at risk of wrecking the entire dollar structure. And when that happens, we're going to take down the emerging market nation debt, but we're not going to kill their economies. They're going to default. And the emerging market nations own between 9 and $15 trillion worth of U.S. dollar-based debt. And we encouraged them to take on that debt because we had near 0%. And we told them there was no risk, therefore. No, there's, there's no interest rate risk. But, you know, try to, try to contact Dominican Republic and ask them how their debt structure is doing after a 40% decline in the Dominican peso. Why is the Dominican peso down so hard? Well, because they're not cooperating with the narco trafficking with the United States and Langley. So they don't get the benefit to their currency like other Latin American countries get. Whoa. Now, do you think that uh, do you think that some country or somebody might just decide, well, let me print um, issue uh, a gold round or a silver round currency and without any money on it and its value can uh, change with the price of the commodity. Uh, would that scare the bejeebas out of the bankers? Well, I don't know. Where would it be used? Well, that's, I guess you'd have to, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really care about a concept like that because if, it, if it's in grandma's garden among her sewing group, I don't care. Okay. Is China going to require it in trade payment? Well, that, that's, where it, that's where it gets real. Depends on where it's used. Uh, I, I don't think that the big Wall Street boys are going to fret about anything that you do unless you get the major trading partners of the world to use it. And that's why they're afraid of the gold trade note, and that's why they're afraid of gold uh, bullion. That's why they're suppressing the price. Um, you know, the, the, the COMEX market, you know, the, the fake the, the fake commodities, commodity exchange, you know, the rigging exchange, whatever you want to call it, uh, how in the hell can they continually get away with this suppressing of 
gold and silver and everything else, really. How do they get away with it? Well, they invade countries that don't use it, like Iraq. They sanction countries that don't use it, like Iran. They make them sound like terrorists when their main offense is they don't like to use the dollar. Okay. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you declare war on a country and invade it like Iraq, steal their central bank gold, hang their leader, when he used to be a real good buddy of Papa Bush and Rumsfeld with plenty of photographs, when Saddam was buying the nerve gas from Papa Bush and the U.S. military, if you invade them and hang the leader, steal their gold, and then make up stories in the controlled press that they, that they confiscated a lot of bars that were yellow and they found out they were all wood painted gold. They stole the Iraqi Central Bank gold and they came up with a phony story that most Americans bought. Okay, so that inhibits other countries from doing the same. Iran has a backbone. They said, F you. We painted them out to be a terrorist because Israel came up with the cock and bull story that Iran is going to nuke Israel and they're got this advanced nuclear program. Oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's such a pack of nonsense. So the United States led a, a European Western wide movement to put sanctions on Iranian banks and assets. Again, that inhibits other nations from doing the same. But now Iran worked around that. They have a, a very clever deal. You see, Obama is such a knucklehead. Uh, in 2000, and I think it was 15, he came up with the Iran sanctions, and he blocked all, all dollar transactions for trade with the Iran Central Bank. <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, gosh, what a blockheaded idiot. He didn't include the Iranian banks. So Iran sold so Iran sold oil to India, and India bought gold from Turkey to pay the big banks of Iran in gold terms for the oil. And a swap was created between the Iran Central Bank and their many big banks. And that's called the gold for oil trade which China and Russia are duplicating right now and I think are going to end up with the gold trade note for trade payment applied to the oil market. So, you know, the U.S. is playing bully tactics. I made a prediction way back when I started the newsletter. It was a year into it in 2005. I said eventually the dollar is going to be supported not by gold but by military action. And, and and we're seeing it now. I made I've made a number of kind of strange forecasts. The, the two that I'm I like to point out the most are uh, when Lehman fell. I said we're going to go quickly down to zero percent and stay there for the longest time, many years. Okay, remember Greenspan went down to zero percent. No, no, it wasn't. Bernanke went down to zero percent and said it's just going to be for six months. I said no, it's not. He's a liar. Okay, two years later, I said, we're going to go to QE and monetize with bond purchases, the U.S. government debt. And Bernanke again said, this is just a temporary six-month thing. I said, no, it's not. He's a liar. We're going to have this almost permanently. So both calls were correct. But I made an unorthodox call back in 2011. The Voice was mentioning back then and, and the year or two previous uh, that there might be some international banker trials. Uh, and it turned out that the only ones who got into trouble were in Iceland. And then the voice backed off and said, you know, we're not going to see any justice. These bankers, they control too much military. They control the central banks. They control many large industries. They control the energy industry. It's just too deep. They control the law enforcement offices. They control military. So we're not going to see justice for the big crimes of bankers. And I wrote him and said, you know what? I think we're going to see the kill of lots and lots of mid-level bankers. And he said, Jim, I think you're exactly right. 
And then I wrote to, to my whole group of colleagues and said, it'll be because the high level bankers will be protected. There'll be board members and VPs. They're made men in, in their syndicate mob, mafia businesses. The lowest level guys, they don't know anything. I, I, I did an experiment in the 1990s. I went into five different banks and I asked them, how do you determine your 30 year mortgage? And they said, we, did, we base it off the 30-year uh, bond yield for the U.S. government. And I said to each one of them, no, you're wrong. It's based on the 10-year bond. You're wrong. And they said, uh, let me check. Let me check. And they went to a manager and came back in five minutes and said, we're not really sure, but you, you might be right on that. I think there's a lot of balancing that goes on with the 10-year. Okay. The bankers at the low levels don't know much about banking. <laughs> And the mid-level bankers, the mid-level bankers, Mitch, they were in charge of setting up what the Enron Corporation with J.P. Morgan called Special Purpose Entities, SPE. It's just a nice word for a shell corporation doing illegal things. The mid-level bankers did the muling, moving multi-millions or billions by bearer bonds from country to country back to the Swiss banks, that's the favorite destination. Okay, the mid-level bankers knew too many details of scummy people, like say the Russian mafia doing investments in London. Some of the dead bankers are agents in the banking industry in London for the Russian mafia. Okay, so it turned out that my forecast was correct because we've seen something like 80 bankers and two of them just in the last month. They're dead. Uh, they knew too much. And they're not protected. They're not high enough ranked. Yes. I, I don't know if you saw, but just recently, I believe it was Spain indicted some of their central bankers over some of the bank failures in Spain. Um, I don't know if you were aware of that. Uh, yes, I, I, I am I am aware of that, but I, but I also believe that that really doesn't amount to much. It's, it's nice for the publicity, but yeah, if you, jail. no, no, these are central banks. Therefore they're club members. The club members don't get arrested. The club members don't go to jail to protect the club members. They kill somebody. Okay. And, well, it's probably cheaper in the end and quieter. Um, remember what, remember what they did to Dominic Strauss-Kahn? Yes, the in New York City, the um, yeah, fake right. rape he, charge. Right, the fake rape charge of the Haitian hotel worker. Yes, and and that that charge stuck because the courts were given orders to make it stick. Okay, that's what happens to bankers who just go awry. They don't get killed; they get sidetracked. Uh, what did Dominic Strauss Kahn want to do? This is fascinating. As an IMF head. He wanted the United States government to prove its gold reserves. Yes, you're asking the, you're asking for serious trouble when you demand something like that. <laughs> um, do you think you know here in the United States? You know, speaking of, of the USA, yet um, our pension funds are a disaster. They're they're failing right there. What there's fifty or more plans now that that the um, the federal government is is actually funding and paying out um, trillion dollars, four trillion dollars, I think, underfunding now. You know, what are the people going to do when they retire and they're screwed? Uh, be poor. What do you think? <laughs> you know, well, let, let, no, but, let let's. You know, it's it's what they will revert to. They don't have any money. Their pension got whacked, so they will be poor. They'll go to Walmart and look for the deals. Uh, okay, here, here's just one example among many. It's the Teamsters. It's the Central States Pension Fund. A lot of Teamsters are in this. I believe it had something like fifty to 70,000 members. And a year ago, this is quite a long time ago, a year ago, I did a story in the Hattrick Letter with details because they had knocked down 
by over 50%, I think it was 52%, 55%, they reduced their pension benefit. So what, what do you do? You become poor. Your income got cut in half, a little more. You become poor. Okay, so that's what happened. And, and if you take a look at some of the internal dynamics, because the Central State Pension Fund is a great example. It used to have 10 uh, con contributors for every one pension uh, beneficiary. Okay, so 10 times as many people putting money in as people pulling money out, okay? The contributor versus pensioner ratio. And the ratio went from 10 to 1 to about 3 and a half to 1. And that's what it was a year ago. That's not sustainable because the contributors are putting in small amounts, hoping that there are a lot of them when the, the, the pensioners are drawing out large amounts. I mean, like, you know, 30, 50, 60,000 a year, depending on how many years they were driving a truck. Okay, so that's just one. There are other pension funds that are liable for this. The, the name of the company, the name of the, the, the uh, facility, if you will, in the U.S. government is called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. This is called the pension pen, pen, pension uh, guarantor. U.S. government pension guarantor says if your company fails and your pension goes down, and, and it, I mean goes down and out and killed, uh, you have a guarantee from the U.S. government of 33 cents on the dollar. Maybe it's 35. I just found out this because I, I inquired. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to turn 65 in May. <laughs> yes. In May. So I'm inquiring about both Social Security and a, a kind of a small pension I had from 13 years of a, of a managed corporate pension system that, that got bought out when my company went away and I lost a job. I got laid off in 1993. It's okay. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm a happy, happy camper now. But the point is that I got reminded from the woman working at that pension fund uh, office. It was not the company. It was the hired pension, the hired fund corporation working on behalf as a, whose client was my company. Okay. So she told me, I, I asked her, what are my options? And she said, well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do that. Uh, not too many options. But uh, I said, well, what happens if, if the company fails, be, that is behind my pension right now? And she said, well, you, you go to the, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation of the U.S. government, and you get 35% or so of your pension. I said, well, that's chicken scraps. And she said, yes, but it's more than nothing. Okay, Mitch, you become poor. Okay. Uh, well, do the American people have any idea how poor they really are? No, because okay. they, they look at their stock accounts, their mutual funds, which are being pumped up by the Fed and the Wall Street banks, and they conclude, I'm doing okay. S&P stock index is setting records. And I ask them, why is the S&P setting records if we're in the seventh consecutive year of a recession? And that's where the that's where the conversation really goes south when they say, oh, no, you don't understand. We've had a recovery for the last five years. We're like in one, two, three percent growth every year. And I said, <laughs> one, two, three percent growth when the inflation rate is what, two percent? When actually, oh, this is a, a fascinating little index. It's called the Chapman, the Chapman Consumer Price Index. Chapman produced his own CPI based on a few different years, based on 500 cities, large and small, in the United States. And he concluded that we have been running between 8 and 10% CPI every single year since Lehman. And he's got 500 objects in his basket whose prices he follows. So he concluded that if we 
if we claim a two and a half percent inflation rate when it's really eight and a half, then we're overstating the economic growth by six full percent. Oh, oh yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, I've read some of these, um, you know, the, the private consumer price index uh, inflation figures versus the government. And, um, you know, it's the government can't afford to pay a COLA, you know, um, because it would kill them. And that's just the absolute truth about it. Do you think that the people actually, um, oh gosh, well, okay, I know. They're not smart enough, really, to know, really understand much of anything when it comes to inflation or deflation. The only thing these folks really understand is that they're paying more, but they don't understand why. Do you well, think? go ahead, Jeff. Well, they know they're paying more now, but they're getting fooled by what we call volume deflation. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a favorite, I don't want to mention brand, there was a favorite little carton of yogurt that I used to buy. And it, it, it was something like, you know, nine and a half ounces or I don't know exactly. And suddenly it was eight. So the price was about the same but the volume went down. So the inflation is coming about from sinister methods. Um, and it's fooling some Americans. I mean, imagine, imagine they, they would say, uh, we're now selling gasoline and it's $2.50 a gallon, but the gallon's a little less than a gallon. Yeah, that's, Yes, we see that all the time in the grocery store, but people see a dollar or a five dollar or a ten dollar a bill, and it's a static instrument. And is it just because they see that static paper asset in front of or debt in front of them? It's really not an asset, but if you see that paper debt in front of you with that number on it, people just don't make the connection between the inflation, deflation, and the prices. Uh, is it just their education? Is that bad? Uh, they don't understand what inflation is. They don't understand uh, the, the construction of the CPI. They don't understand a lot of things. They don't understand the, the effects of QE and monetizing our debt. Is there any way that we can, um, how can we, the people, protect ourselves from this, uh, from the currency wars? I guess that's a bit good description. You know, the currency wars that are kind of happening right now, and so the dollar dies or shakes out or just inflates and then disappears. Um, what can we, the people, do? Buy gold, buy silver, and, and wait for the crisis to hit. Should, should we be trying to um, get ourselves kind of more independent and somewhat isolated from, you know, the system the way it is today? Well, yeah. They, people need to sell their stocks and bonds, which are artificially propped up in value by the central bank and the Wall Street banks. Get rid of them and use the money to buy gold and silver because I'm pretty sure silver is going to go up tenfold. I'm pretty sure gold is going to go up fivefold. So we, we can protect ourselves. It's just we have to take, you know, the government isn't going to encourage any of this because they don't want, they don't want the people to under, to really know what's coming. Um, you know, the globalism and the corporate economies of scale, you know, have these, are these like natural evolutions of, of the corporate world, you know, of where everything just grows so big and they, they make so much of what is dependent on that, um, on that factory? Well, we've gotten the, to the situation where the banks are just too giant. The banks are really not 
commercial banks in their function anymore. When I was a little kid, if you were to point to, say, Wall Street and uh, some of the bigger cities in the United States and say, what exactly is the business behind those banks? You would hear things like, well, in Wall Street, they do investment banking, bringing companies to market for stocks and bringing debt to market for the corporate bond market. But they also have a lot of loans for, say, establishing a, a fabrication plant for, say, the car industry. That's not true anymore. The big banks are casinos. The big Wall Street banks have very little corporate bond issuance anymore. They have very little corporate stock IPO issuance anymore. The big banks are deeply involved in two big things. I call it the bond carry trade and the derivative operations. Here's what the bond carry trade is. You see, these big banks, they don't need corporate customers anymore. They're casinos. They're borrowing at near 0% from the Fed, and they're investing in treasury bonds, pushing down the bond yield. So that's good for the bond market. It's good for the mortgage market, except that it's really in the intensive care unit, and you can add oxygen to the to the patient in the intensive care unit, and that doesn't mean he's going to go running around the track at the nearby football stadium. Okay, the, so the big banks are involved in this bond carry trade. Borrow at zero, invest in the 2.5% bond. They make a lot of money that way. They're doing it with billions of dollars, and that's one of their profit lines, but they're doing something worse. They're using futures contracts with 20 and 25 fold leverage to make that two and a half percent difference 50 and 70 percent per year. They can't make that kind of money with with uh, their commercial portfolio with companies expanding. And besides, companies are not expanding. We don't have much of the auto industry left anymore. A very ugly secret about the U.S. auto industry is much of it is assembly plants for Japanese engines and parts. The second function for the big banks that's ugly is they're involved in derivative operations. They're, they're buying on behalf uh, of the U.S. government, like with working with J.P. Morgan, working with the Fed, they're buying treasury bonds so that the treasury bonds purchased with the derivative machinery is not all at J.P. Morgan. So they all have the equal risk. That, that's what I was addressing before regarding the, uh, the lashing and the shared risk. If one goes down, several go down. If one, I guarantee, if one Wall Street bank goes down, they all go down. If one of them's in very, very serious trouble of default, they will all be in very serious trouble of default. Okay, that's just one derivative function. They also involved in trading of what's called credit default swaps. They might sense, for instance, that Macy's and Sears and a few others, they, go, they focus on the big ones because that's where the volume is. Macy's and Sears and their corporate debt looks like it's going to fail. So they'll buy an insurance policy on it. And they'll make money if they fail. They're called credit default swaps, CDSs. Wow. But here's the ugliest, the ugliest thing that the big banks are investing in. And I don't know the exact name of it, uh, but it has the word indemnity in it. They're buying life insurance policies for their mid-level bankers who are getting killed. So, and they're making money out because they go up like, like threefold in value because they're being traded 
and the insiders are passing word around that so-and-so's at risk. Why is he at risk? Well, because he's managing a whole bunch of things that are really dangerous. No, no, no. He's at risk because he's been marked by his own management for the kill. Okay. They have to that, silence. Uh, death is silence. So. Yeah, but they they do talk. They leak. We're now seeing the effect of the power of leak uh, across the U.S. government highest levels right now. The leaks. I don't want to get into the content of the leaks. Let's just say that the leaks are now causing a very big problem leading to investigations, leading to charges, leading to resignations. I want to see McCain and Graham resign. I want to see Schumer resign because they're going to be attacked soon by the contents of the leaks. So very dangerous times here. Hey, oy, oy. So... about an hour and uh, I want to thank you for joining us and uh, this is uh, Jim Willie uh, from uh, the uh, website is uh, the gold is goldjackass.com and he publishes the uh, the hat trick newsletter and if you want to know what's going to happen and you want to get the insider information get the hat trick newsletter and be aware of what is really going on today well, it's a pleasure being on, and uh, you know, just as a quick point, we, we have a question we didn't get to, and that was globalism and its effect effect on economies. I, I just want to make a quick remark that, that the word globalist is being used in the press. Whenever you read that, think of the global fascist state where you as a person become a piece of cattle. Tax farm, uh, I guess is a good description. <laughs> so, yeah, animal farm, tax farm, whatever you want to call it. But the global fascist state is not something that we want, and that is something that Trump is working avidly against. And that's why he's being opposed by the darkest sides of our government that include Langley, our security agencies. It includes Congress, which I think cuts across both Democrat and Republican parties for the neocons. The neocons are essentially neo-fascists, and they were correct. They could get elected much more easily if they called themselves the neocons than if they called themselves the neo-fascists. So now they're cutting across both parties. I think Obama was a neocon, and kind of a good piece of proof was if you look at the players in the State Department for the Obama administration, they're pretty much the same. Many people were holdovers, but the policies are very much the same with the Bush II administration. So globalist means fascist. And they got the news networks to join in on the fascist movement. That's why they're so anti-Trump. The fascists destroy everything they touch. So they've destroyed the banks and they're just about done destroying the U.S. economy. And they're busy destroying the global economy because destroying an economy, Mitch, actually favors their path for installing the global fascist state with their fascist trade unit unions that Obama tried to get going, but Trump abandoned immediately. That's the global fascist state. It's the globalist elites. It's their project. And if it ever comes to be, the U.S. is going to turn into a very dark place with no human rights, people gone missing left and right, and, you know, black market and human organs. If you think there's no black market in human organs, then you just fell off the turnip truck because it's a major industry for the Israeli security agencies. 
who are working closely with Ukraine, which has thousands of cadavers in the forests dumped outside Kiev, which are missing their major organs. Well, you have to fund a war somehow, Jim. <laughs> no, no, no. It's funded by narcotics, Mitch. Oh, okay. That's a side business. That's a side business. Right. Oh, that's their gravy. I'm sorry. The, their real hardcore business is uh, Afghanistan and, and guarding the poppy fields. <laughs> right, right. That, that's, that's very much the case, that's yes. Sad, and it's really sad and true. Um, do you think that, um, that the local economies can, can rebound, can rebound and, and uh, become strong again? It depends on a few things. It depends how big their trade deficit is. It depends on whether they can feed themselves, whether their domestic food supply is adequate. The United States imports half its food supply. When I was a little kid, it imported like 5 or 10%. So that's not progress. Uh, countries that are poor often tend to be rather self-reliant agriculturally. That's going to work in their favor. If they also happen to have some undeveloped natural resources like coal mines, copper mines, that they just you know halted the mining for, for whatever reason, they're going to be doing okay. But nations that have signed on with the U.S. with full commitment toward the dollar that buffer their currencies with favors done with narco money laundering, they're going to be at high risk. If you think that's only one or two nations, you are very, very wrong. Well, I, I'd say it's, there's only a handful of nations that aren't. <laughs> I would say that, the majority of nations. That, that, could, that could be true. That could be true, but I, I believe when it comes to nations like France and Germany, I don't know that they're covering the euro currency forex trading balancing. I don't think they're covering that with narcotics. I think they're covering black bag operations uh, for their security agencies. I think Soros is involved with narcotics funding. You know, I was, I, 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 I was thinking about last week when um, they announced that Argentina had what ten billion in gold reserves left. I believe it was Argentina. And, um, you know, they were such a, a wealthy nation at one time. And um, today they're destitute. Uh, is it socialism? Is it just they're not on with the U.S. banking system? Or is it a combination of several things? I think the, the main factor is the first one that you mentioned. Argentina in the 70s became the first nation in the American hemisphere to be full-fledged fascist. You saw 40,000 young people disappear, the desesperados, desaparecidos, rather, so I, I said desperate ones. No, des, des, desparecidos, the dis, disappeared ones. You had the military junta take over. You had corporation heads join up with fraudulent government functions. You did not have proper economic development. And all this time, in the 70s and 80s, Henry Kissinger made secret visits to Argentina, insisting that they not be photographed. Why was that? Because he was meeting with all the Nazi holdovers from Germany. Well, I, I have no... I I will have no problem with uh, Henry Kissinger for Gitmo. Okay, how's that sound? Uh, I, I believe that's where him and a lot of these uh, these people belong, um, but they're not going to go willingly and they're not going to go quietly. And if now that now they're not going to go at all, Mitch. They're going to be killed or not. Okay, because they have so if much money. I mean, you can't break their money. I don't think you can break. Well, their you, money. well, let me give you an idea of, of how Henry Kissinger acquired some of his money. <clears throat> I know this from uh, a contact of mine. The Iraqi Reconstruction Fund. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Yes, Jim. Okay. 
Do you remember how it suddenly lost $3 billion? I remember there was a quite amount of missing money, all on $100 in pallets. Yeah, well, it, there were unauthorized bank wire transfers to Henry Kissinger totaling $2.3 billion. This is how he maintains his pocket money for doing whatever he does for the Trilateral Commission and the global fascist state elite think tanks. He didn't have to pay it back. In fact, the fellow who was in charge, George Tenet, of that fund was given by President Bush II a Congressional Medal of Honor. Yes, he was. When 2.3 or $3 billion was stolen from it. So was he given the medal because it was stolen or was he given the medal for other reasons? Oh. <laughs> Please, now let's not talk about that, they said. <laughs> That's why I got 2.3 billion reasons. <laughs> the I believe truly, Mitch, I believe truly that the narcotics rings that operate for the major governments of the world, primarily the West, are intended to bring about, facilitate, encourage, and bribe for the installation of the global fascist state. It is the glue. Well, you know, it certainly can provide the financial um, pathway to do that. Um, and certainly the blackmail opportunities. So, uh, wow. That, you know, that's, that's kind of... The, the blackmail... The blackmail is not over cocaine. That's very small. I mean, you don't provide cocaine to a bunch of congressmen and then blackmail them. The cocaine is used during the sex parties. But you blackmail them with the children they've been photographed with. <laughs> well, that's yeah, what... yeah, I know. I, I just prefer to call it sex sex parties okay. because because they might involve homosexuality and they might involve they might involve, oh, I, I don't want to get into a, a long description of this, but there are times when with certain makeup and certain clothing, a 15-year-old girl can look 19. So just to, because you see a picture of a guy with a, a beautiful younger woman, it doesn't mean she's a minor. She might be a minor. She might not be a minor. You don't know. Sometimes you can tell pretty clear, oh, that's a minor, my God. But other times you can't. Um, they're, they're blackmailing. This is the gut, the nut, the gut, and the nucleus of the entire pedophile leaked story, files, transcripts, and database. They're using sex parties and cocaine to blackmail U.S. government officials, congressmen, senators, you name it, judges, bankers, to bribe them into following the party line toward installing the fascist state. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if the head of, Z the head of CNN has been to Lolita Island in the Bahamas with Clinton on numerous occasions with sex parties with underage girls and cocaine. That's the head of CNN. So, is the head of CNN going to come out with stories against the pedophiles? Or is he going to toe the party line and criticize Trump? Hey, Trump, you're in trouble. What'd you do today? <laughs> hey, um... There, there was some news out. Uh, just I don't know. I, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but there, um, there was a. They were talking on um, on ZeroHedge.com this morning um, about that. It appears that China sent a the world a false uh, reflation signal, and that there's virtually no price through anywhere in the production chain of China. And 
I, I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking, and because I had watched, I believe it was uh, the Bill that did that one video on China and their manufacturing. And in that video, the, the, there was a, a manufacturer that moved from the United States to China, and, and he he made drywall and plywood. Well, it ended up he just pretty much said he says I don't get a profit. I get my profit from the Chinese government. Um, is that essentially how manufacturing works in China? I, mean, I, I, I don't know. That's why I, you know. That's why I to ask. I'm not really sure. Are, are you saying that the the, uh, the the producer the producer price index is flat, not increasing? Well, um, I guess they're talking about um, the, the pass, -through, pass through profit price, maybe. Of you know, here in the United States, whenever we produce something, we have our own profit and sell it. And in China, you know, they make it at cost. They give it to the next company at cost. The next company at cost. And then when it goes out the export door, the Chinese government uh, pays the, uh, the profit margin, I guess, back to the corporations. Uh, that, that's uh, the twig. I, I, oh, in other words, the government, the Chinese government has turned into a wholesaler, forcing, forcing, forcing the entire supply chain to operate without profit. Yes, sir. Well, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard that. It's I'll fascinating. Look that I'll, look that, I'll look that up and I'll link that. You, I'll send that YouTube video link to you where they were talking about it. Um, because I thought that was interesting because, you know, what chance would anybody have to compete against someone that literally doesn't have a pass through profit margin, so to speak, from piece goods, you know, in their manufacture? So, uh, it, it, I don't know. It's just, it was something I saw this morning and I wanted to uh, ask you about it because. I often wondered, that seemed strange, that this guy said, you know, I really didn't get my profit from my factory. I got 20%, you know, of my calls back from the government as my profit. I thought that was really interesting, and I thought, well, that's real capitalism. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, hey, thank you very much. A great interview. Very interesting, sir, and Jim, and, um... Uh, anytime you, you know you want to come back, just give me a call. Or if you have something that you want to tell the people that you feel that they, you know, they need to know. Number one, they need to go to goldenjackass.com and subscribe to your newsletter to find out the truth of what they're missing. Well, thank you for having me on, and I appreciate the opportunity and uh, reach a new audience. Covered some interesting topics and. People need to understand that the, uh, the dollar is toxic, most of their paper assets are very vulnerable, and we need to understand what fascism is because it, it got installed since 9-11, and we need to reverse this, but reversing it involves what they call treason.